Let us pray. Lord, may the words that are spoken bring you praise. May the words that are spoken be seasoned with love and grace. And may his words and deeds we do bring glory and not shame to your name this day. Amen. Joshua 24, verses 14 through 18. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us to our par- and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I didn't know y'all liked barbecue this much, but I'm glad that you're here. (laughs) I really am. Uh, I wanted to introduce Brad one more time. Several months ago, I mentioned that when I was in kindergarten, I picked up the phone, this before dialing in our big city, I picked up the phone. The operator said, number please. And I said, I want to speak to Brad. And the lady said, Brad? I said, yes, ma'am, Brad. Then she said, does Brad have a brother? I said, yes, Benji. Okay. And the next thing I know, I'm talking to Brad. That's how small a town we were from, but I'm glad that Brad is here today. I, I can actually keep a friend for about 65 years, so that's, that's good. We're glad that, and we're glad all of you are here. Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will, sh- uh, we will serve the Lord. Somewhere way back in my life, maybe when I first read the Bible all the way through, I came across this scripture Joshua from Joshua 24. And it became kind of our household verse. We, June and I have two daughters, Allison's here, and Leslie's not. (laughs) Her boy's going to Boy Scout camp. I'm, you know, I'm not going to throw any stones. But we were having trouble with one of them. (laughs) I'm joking, I'm joking. But we were, this became our household prayer, this, this scripture. And then in 1994, I was asked by the lay, de- lay leader of our church if I would do the laity Sunday. I was a lay, lay person, and the, the tradition was that on the commitment Sunday for the stewardship campaign, they would ask a lay person to, to preach, and I preached, and I used the scripture. And then four years later, I went into the ministry and I preached this scripture. Nobody threw anything at me. And according to Dondra, that's the standard. If they don't throw anything at you, you've done a good job. So they hadn't done it. So I preached that at my first, first church, Philadelphia, 1998. And when I moved to St. Mark in 2010, I preached this sermon. Well, fast forward about five years. I have been appointed to Kingswood and I come to meet with the uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee. I met with Brian over at, the, over at the Parsonage and I came over here and he passed me over to Jim Lundy and Jim was showing me around the church and I learned a lot about Alan that day. I was supposed to go with Jim. He and I were going to go alone on this tour and the next thing I know, Alan is being Alan and Alan went with us. And he was correcting Jim half of the way around. (laughs) But when I walked into the sanctuary and I looked up and it said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, I knew I was home. I did. 
So about five weeks later, we we're packing up everything. And the day we finished packing up all our stuff in Augusta, we were backing out of the garage. And there's this sign that we just about forgot that said in the garage, it said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we got out of the car and got it off the wall. And we had a little moment together, June and I. So you fast forward now nine years. And on May the 2nd, they loaded up all our earthly possessions. And were taking them away back to Augusta. And we were about to leave the parsonage. And June turned around and looked. And we looked up above the door. And it said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we had another good cry. Amen, didn't we? It was, and we hugged each other. That, this scripture has gone with me for a long time. So this is where it comes from. So the question I have, I guess, for us, have you ever gotten where you really didn't want to make a choice? You were so tired of making decisions that you said, God, just, for, just deliver me from making another decision. When we were back in Augusta, as was our custom, that's a biblical phrase, as was our custom, every Friday night, we had a date night. I could not plan anything on Friday night without her permission. It was her night. And so one night, we did the things we normally do. We got dressed, we, and we went to the car and said, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? We backed out of the, of the garage, went to the driveway, where you want to go? I don't know. We pulled out in the street and went down the street and stopped at the stop. Where do you want to go? I don't care. Went to the main drag, Washington Road in Augusta. Where do you want to go? I don't know. We turned right, started going toward some of the restaurants and said, where do you want to go? I said, let's just go home and eat cereal. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, we were so tired of doing the same old things that we just didn't, nobody wanted to make a decision. But really and truly, when you don't make a decision, you're making a decision, aren't you? Yogi Berra said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. You got to take it. And so that's what we're talking about today. Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. For those of you who are not familiar with Joshua, Joshua was one of those children of Israel in Egypt. He was with Moses and the million plus Israelites who were there, who were being persecuted, who were in slavery. And God spoke. And Moses answered. There were the, the plagues that happened. Let my people go. Joshua saw all that. He saw and experienced what it's like to go through the Red Sea when it parted. He made it to the desert in the wilderness and he understood what it was like to, for Moses to strike the stone and water to come out. He understood what it was like to get manna every day except Sunday or Sabbath. He knew what it was like for quail. He knew all those things. And when they got to the edge of the promised land, they picked 12 spies, one spy from every tribe. Joshua was one, and a man named Caleb, and the other 10 aren't worth remembering. <laughs> Excuse me, Lord. <laughs> and they go into the desert, go across into the promised land, and they, everybody agreed. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. It has all these resources. It's, they have walled cities. They have all this stuff. But they have giants in the land. And the naysayers said, we cannot take these people. And Joshua said, with God we can do anything. And they did what people tend to do. You don't know what you're talking about. We ain't going to follow you. We aren't going to do that. And they ripped their clothes, they sat in ashes and sackcloth, and they did all those things. And in the process, God said, you're right, you're not going. And for 40 years, they wandered around in the desert until all of those people died. 
It was a new generation. Moses had even died. And they crossed into the promised land. And the scripture that, that Cameron read is Moses' last sermon to his people. Choose for yourself to say who you're going to serve. Is it going to be the gods of the, the people in Egypt? And all that they worship? Or is it going to be the, the gods of the people of the Amorites in the land where you're living? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they agreed with Joshua. Today is a day that we must choose. We truly need to choose. My mouth is getting ready to stick together. And it will have to be surgically separated. So I'm going to drink some water. Might need to get a new bottle. So what does it mean to, to choose this day? One of the things I know that happens in life is that good things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to bad people. And bad things happen to good people. Is that an amen? Times get hard sometimes, don't they? Over the last nine years, we've seen some hard times. We have. And what Jesus tells us is this. In Matthew 11, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Put my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And find rest from your labors. Jesus wants us to choose this day to come to him. He's not going to take away all your problems. If you think you are, you come and go and you, that's not going to happen. Bad things happen. But Jesus is willing to walk with you, to comfort you, to let us know a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing when we see the body of Christ come alongside people who are hurting. To love each other. While, through, and after. And I've seen that here where we have come to each other. We've come to the Lord and the Lord, we have walked with the Lord, being yoked with the Lord. Some of you might not have ever experienced what that is like and you might need to choose this day to understand what that feels like and know what it's like. It is a wonderful feeling to know at peace that surpasses all understanding. If coming is not what you really need today, or may you be who I have, you're trying to figure out what's next in your life. Well, in Matthew 4, Jesus is walking along the seashore, and he comes across uh, Andrew and Peter, their brothers, and they were casting nets. And Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He goes a little bit further, and he sees, he sees James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they're working on their nets on a boat. And Jesus says, follow me. And they leave their nets. They leave the boat. They leave their dad. They leave it all and follow Jesus. Now, that was the inbreaking of the kingdom of God into the life of those fishermen. Work is not evil. Priorities are what makes things... In the case, their case, they, fishing was all they had. They did it. And Jesus was asking them to change their priorities. And they did. They dropped it all and followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. Sometimes it takes following Jesus, to do a little bit more, to maybe read a little deeper, pray a little differently, meditate, 
be an accountability group. Understand what a change in, in your life can happen when we truly follow Jesus. Back in the late 80s, June and I built a house. Y'all know this story too because I've told it 20 times. But we built a house out in the country. If you don't know what country is, sometimes they have these things called fields that, that trees or buildings are not on. And when you get out there and there are no street lights, you can see the stars. It is a beautiful thing. I, I recommend that to any of you that's never seen the stars in a field. But we moved out to the country. And across the interstate from us, was Bob and Edith Hayes. I had grown, grown up knowing them. We both all went to the same church together. It was, it was good stuff. We had a neighbor. They were, by the way, the crow flies across the interstate. It wasn't that far, but you couldn't get that, that way. You had to go around. Bob liked to run and walk, and one night he went out to run with a friend of his, and he didn't come back. He died of a heart attack while doing it. And so, about a month later, I called Edith. She and I called, and we asked if she'd like to go walking, because she used to do that with her husband. And so, she said yes. So, we went over, and we walked about two and a half miles, and then asked if she wanted to do it again, and she did, and we got to do it at a habit. And then school starts, and my wife, being the dutiful and just great mother, she said, somebody's got to do the homework and make sure the kids do the homework. And so I'm going to stay here and do that. If you, want, if you think you need to walk with Edith, you can go ahead. I didn't understand what she was saying. I said, okay. So I kept walking with Edith. And we got to walking about four to five times a week. We'd walk three quarters or about a third of a mile out to the street road and walk down 2.67 miles every night. And we talked about everything under the sun. We talked about death and our personal experiences with death. Her father had died of esophageal cancer, and she saw the pain that he went through with the burning from the radiation and all that went with that for about a year. She talked about the sudden loss of her soulmate, where she says, bye as he's going out to run and him not coming back. All I knew was what I knew in my own personal experience of my dad dying in his sleep and my brother burning to death in a car wreck. And so we had a lot to talk about, about grief. And we talked about life and we talked about the Lord. And after a period of time, I learned that I didn't have, have what she had and what she had, I wanted. Because what she was doing each and every day she was a follower of Jesus Christ. She read her Bible. She prayed. She stayed in the Word. She stayed connected to the church. Through matter all that went on in her life, she taught Sunday school. She just did her thing and did it beautifully. And in the course of her following, she helped me learn how to follow. I would not be here today without Edith. She knows it. She knows it. It is a beautiful thing to watch someone follow Jesus. And there are people who are watching you as you follow Jesus. And there are people who want to follow you even if you are not following Jesus. Maybe today is the day you want to choose to follow Jesus. Well, some of you, y'all know about coming and you're walking with people who are in pain and suffering, you know what it means to follow Jesus and people, are, you're helping people along that journey but there's something else you might can choose today might be the day that you choose to go in Matthew 28 Jesus has, he's been crucified, he's been buried, he's been raised from the dead he's about to be ascending, ascending into heaven and, he, and his disciples are together and he says Go ye therefore, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, making disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. That's what we are called to do. That's what we are commanded to do. That is our great commission. That's our sending orders. 
is to go, to make a difference boldly for the kingdom of God. It truly is. This is a, the best illustration in all sermonhood. It happened in the 80s. How many of you are familiar with the Darwin Awards? Do we have any finalists? <laughs> this guy won the Darwin Award one year. His name was Larry Water, Waters. He was, uh, he was an unemployed truck driver, lived in Los Angeles. His Saturday afternoon was not to watch SEC football. It was to go in his backyard and then drink about a six-pack of beer. Start with that with, in his lounge chair. And then he would go from there. Well, one day, I'm guessing after two six-packs, he gets a bright idea. And so he drives and goes to an Army-Navy surplus store and buys three or four weather balloons and some helium and some rope. And he comes back home and he gets his neighbors and they tie that chair to the ground where it won't go anywhere. He fills the balloons with helium, ties them to the chair, goes inside, gets another six-pack of beer, fixes them a few bologna sandwiches, gets a BB gun, and his idea was he was going to tell the guys to let go and it would move up maybe 150 feet, 200 feet above his neighborhood because what he wanted to be able to do was see what his neighborhood looked like from above. He is the reason they are drones now. <laughs> he didn't have a drone and he wanted to be the drone. So he said, let me go. And he, they let him, and he doesn't go up slowly. He, to 10,000 feet. There were planes trying to land at LAX and one of them called the tower and said, you won't believe what just passed me. A man in a, a lounge chair with a, a six pack and a BB gun. Needless to say, they had to close down LAX or whatever. They put all these helicopters in the air trying to get him four or five hours later. They get him down. And of course, they had a reporter there. And the reporter asked him three questions. First one, were you afraid? Yep. <laughs> you going to do it again? Nope. <laughs> Why'd you do it in the first place? His answer was, you just can't sit there. We have been called to go. And you just can't sit there. What we have is something that needs to be shared with the world completely, openly, to a world that is living in darkness. It's still living in darkness. When they wrote those words, there was no electricity. And we're still living in darkness. There are people who are crying out to know where to turn when they have the problems that we've experienced in our life and we had the Lord to come to. There are people that live in darkness who have no one to follow. And so they follow anything and anybody. Because nobody has gone. Or not enough have gone. Let me get some more water. Because this thing's going to glue up together and it'll be 3 o'clock. There was a church out in Oregon that was a part of, they got involved in prison fellowships, uh, Angel Tree. And in that program, what they would do is prison fellowship would give the churches names of children in their community who had at least one child in prison. And so this church took a number of those children, and on Christmas Eve, they took these presents to this, this church, or to this mobile home. And there were three little kids there. And they gave them the gifts. And the other part was that you would give them a Bible and they would read the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, to them before they gave them, the, or as they were giving them the gifts and all. And so they read the story. They thanked them. 
And then they said, our church is not that far away. We'd love for you to come to church if you're interested. It's just two or three blocks down that way, turn left. They all knew where it was. And he said, come, we, we'd love to see you. And so two or three days later, there was a knock on the preacher's study. And he opened the door and there were these three little ragamuffins. And he said, can I help you? He said, the man who brought us our Christmas gift said, if we ever want to come by the church and look around, somebody would show us around. And he said, you're right. You're at the right place. And so the preacher showed him around the church. He went to the preschool. He went to the uh, elementary Sunday school classes and the youth classes and the adult classes. Went to the gym, showed him the kitchen, showed him the sanctuary. They did all that they could do. He, they thanked him. They left. About 35 minutes, 40 minutes later, there was a knock on the preacher's door, and he opened the door, and it was the oldest brother. And he asked, this question, asked these two questions. Can you come to your church if your socks don't match? Sure. Absolutely. He said, can you come to your church if you don't have any socks at all? Absolutely. So the next Sunday, these three little children showed up on the second row, first row, and they, the oldest, he didn't know how long church was going to last, kind of like y'all. And he had, he had cooked a hot dog. He cooked a hot dog and had some pork and beans, one of those, and had that in a can in the, in the sack. And that church wrapped their arms around them and loved them. And showed them the love of Christ like they had never been seen. One parent in jail for, for prostitution and one in jail for being, selling dope. And the church went where they were supposed to go. And they brought them in and loved them. That's what it means to go. It truly is what it means to go. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous answered him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty or give you something to drink? When did we see you? A stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you. When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king replied, I will tell you the truth. Whatever you did unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. Today is a day that we all need to choose to go. I pray that we will choose together and to go where Jesus calls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.